the identification of the Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, and Germanic peoples as the surviving members of the race of Israel leaves us with two other questions to answer. First, who are the Jews? And second, was Jesus Christ a Jew? To answer these questions, we must first define what we mean by Jew. The muddled thinking of most people on this subject is due to the fact that they never know just what they do mean by Jew. Sometimes they mean a Jew by religion, regardless of his race, for Negroes and Chinese have been converted to Judaism. Or sometimes they mean a Jew by race, regardless of his religion. For example, Premier Ben-Gurion of the Jewish nation in Palestine is a Buddhist by religion, though a Jew by race. And usually, people don't even know which of these two they mean. Since it can be answered quickest, let us first take the question, was Jesus Christ a Jew by religion? The answer is clearly no. Jesus had the true religion of the Old Testament, found in the Law and the Prophets, and he constantly rebuked the Jews for having abandoned this for Judaism under the Babylonian Talmud, which in his day was called the Tradition of the Elders. In Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18, he said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Jesus constantly rebuked the Jews for their apostasy, for setting aside the laws of God in favor of the tradition of the elders. This Talmudic Judaism was very different from the religion we find in the Old Testament. The late Rabbi Stephen F. Wise, chief rabbi of the United States, expressed it so clearly that I can't improve on his words. He said, The return from Babylon and the adoption of the Babylonian Talmud marks the end of Hebrewism and the beginning of Judaism. Since the true religion of the Old Testament was the religion of the real Hebrews, not Jews, the learned rabbi was right in calling it Hebrewism, and noting that it came to its end when the Talmud, then called the tradition of the elders, was adopted, and that this was the beginning of a new religion, Judaism. So we read in Matthew 15, verses 1 to 9, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? for they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. The same incident is found also in Mark 7, verses 5 to 13. In John 5, verses 37 to 46, Jesus told the Jews, The Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and it is they which testify of me. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Again in John 8, verses 54 and 55, he said, it is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God, yet ye have not known him. In John 15, verse 23, Jesus said, He that hateth me hateth my Father also. In the 21st chapter of Matthew, Jesus summed up the position of the Jews by saying that even the tax collectors and the harlots could enter the kingdom of God before the Jews. Surely Christ's entire ministry was a complete demonstration that he was not a Jew by religion. Then was Jesus a Jew by race? To answer this, we must trace the racial ancestry of both Jesus and the Jews. Jesus Christ was a pure-blooded member of the tribe of Judah, and no true Judahite was a Jew by race, as we shall see. Jesus' ancestry is given in both the first chapter of Matthew and the third chapter of Luke. Both of them show that he was a descendant of the patriarch Judah through one of his twin sons, Pharis. <clears throat> By his mother Mary, he came through the line of David and Nathan, the brother of Solomon, as traced in the third chapter of Luke. 
Jesus Christ was therefore a pure-blooded Israelite of the tribe of Judah, as Paul says in Romans 9, verses 4 and 5. Now, let us trace the racial descent of the Jews. First, let us note that the Jews were not and are not Israelites. Yes, I know, you've been taught that Jew and Israelite were the same thing, but no greater falsehood was ever taught, as we shall see. Let us get the first proof of this from Jesus Christ himself. He stated plainly in Matthew 15, verse 24, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Therefore he was sent to those who were of Israel, but not to others. Accordingly, when he sent his twelve disciples out to preach his gospel, Matthew 10, verses 5 and 6 records that he told them this, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he added, Ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. That's Matthew 10, verse 23. They could have gone over all the cities of Judea in a month. So it was obvious that the cities of Israel to which he referred were the cities of the so-called lost tribes who were then ready to enter Europe in their long migration. But take careful note of Jesus Christ's own words. I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. If the Jews were any part of Israel, then they would have been some of his sheep. But he says they were not. In the tenth chapter of John, Jesus says this, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by mine. But he tells the Jews, and it says Jews, but ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Note carefully those words. He does not say that the reason that the Jews are not his sheep is that they don't believe, and that they could become his sheep just by changing their minds. To the contrary, he says that the reason they don't believe is that they are not of his sheep. He knows his sheep, and knows that the Jews are not of his sheep. Since the Jews are not any part of any tribe of Israel, then who are the Jews? Let's trace their ancestry. We find they were made up of several Canaanite peoples. God required that the true line of his people must be kept free from mongrelization with the neighboring Canaanites. Accordingly, Genesis 24, verses 3 and 4, records that Abraham took great pains to see that his son Isaac should only marry a woman of his own people. Likewise, Genesis 27, verses 46 to 28, verse 1, records that Isaac also required that his son Jacob, the father of the Israelites, should also marry only within his own race line. This law had been obeyed for many centuries to keep the race line pure. But one of the sons of Israel, the patriarch Judah, father of the tribe of Judah, violated it by marrying a Canaanite woman who bore him three sons, of whom only one, Shelah, survived and left descendants. See Genesis 38, verses 1 to 5. This half-breed mongrel line of descendants by Shelah must be distinguished from Judah's pure-blooded descendants by his twin sons, Phares and Zarah. Judah fathered Phares and Zarah by his daughter-in-law, Tamar. Although born out of wedlock, they were of pure Israel stock on both sides, and from one of them, Phares, Jesus Christ was descended. The descendants of these twins are the real tribe of Judah. The half-breed son, Shelah, accompanied Judah into Egypt, and in the following centuries left many descendants. They were in the Exodus, and accompanied the armies of Israel into the promised land. See Genesis 48, verse 12, and Numbers 26, verse 20. However, they bred true to type. They were half-breed Canaanites, lacking the spiritual insight which God gave to his own people. So they remained idolaters, Baal worshippers. In 1 Chronicles 4, verse 21, you will find them referred to as the house of Ashbeah. Ashbea is a corruption of Ish-Baal, man of Baal, and shows that they were still idolaters, Baal worshippers, unable to perceive the God of Israel. So these Shelanites, half-breeds, formed one of the peoples of the land who made up the Jews in the time of Jesus Christ. 
Another alien racial group who became part of the Jews were the mixed multitude, which Exodus 12, verse 38 says, left Egypt along with the children of Israel. The Hebrew word here translated mixed is the word Arab, meaning half-breed or mongrel. During the two centuries in Egypt, many had violated the divine law against race mixing, and these were the results. On the Exodus, when the going became hard in the wilderness, the Bible records that this mixed multitude made a lot of trouble and led some of the Israelites even into rebellion. See Numbers 11, verses 4 to 6. This mongrelized group were still in the land even after the return from the Babylonian captivity, for we find them listed in Nehemiah 13, verse 3, as still in the land and still a source of trouble. These also were among the Jews in Christ's time. Then there were the various other Canaanite peoples who were still in the land, chief of whom were the Jebusites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, and the Amorites. When the Israelites were about to enter the Promised Land, God gave them specific instructions to completely drive out or exterminate all of these Canaanites, saying, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou, and when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them nor show mercy unto them. But of the cities of these people which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, Thou shalt save alive nothing that breathes, but thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. See Numbers 33, verses 51 to 56, Deuteronomy 7, verses 1 to 6, Deuteronomy 20, verses 16 to 18. <clears throat> Now, I know that it's fashionable among the liberal church members of today to look down their noses at God and say, I just can't believe in that cruel God of the Old Testament. However, I think he will manage very well without their belief. He always has a good reason for what he does and what he tells us to do. The Bible doesn't argue with you about the reasons for its rules. It just states the rule. But there is always a good reason if you will look for it. For about 2,000 years, the Canaanites had worshipped Baal and Ishtar, the most immoral religion in the world, with the possible exception of some Hindu religions even today. Part of the worship of Baal and Ishtar consisted of the compulsory prostitution of all the women. On certain festival days of the year, all the women of the village had to sit in the field outside the village gate, and any wandering camel driver who came along could select the woman of his choice hand her the coin, which she must pay over to the temple, then take her aside and leave with her his syphilis or gonorrhea, as the case might be. This funneled into Palestine the venereal diseases of all Western Asia. Any doctor can tell you that one infection of syphilis, not cured, can produce degenerative changes in the children for as many as four generations. But the Canaanites had been replenishing the disease with new infections every generation for 2,000 years. They were not physically, mentally, morally, or spiritually fit to marry or even associate with our people. Therefore, God warned the Israelites to exterminate them. If you do not, he warned them, you will have integration. Your children will grow up with theirs as playmates. They will intermarry until you become as badly polluted as they are, and I will have to destroy you as I am commanding you to destroy them, and for the same reason. But the Israelites are always soft-hearted and soft-headed. While they did exterminate the people of Jericho and a couple of other cities, the Bible records that they left most of the others alive, merely making them pay a heavy tribute tax. For example, the city later named Jerusalem was named Jebus at the time the Israelites came in. The Bible records that the Jebusites were neither killed nor driven out, but continued to live among the people of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. See Joshua 15, verse 63. Joshua
Judges 1, verse 21, and 19, verses 10 to 12. First Chronicles 11, verses 4 to 9, and Second Chronicles 8, verses 7 and 8. Even after the people of the southern kingdom of Judah returned from the 70 years' captivity in Babylon, the Jebusites were still in the land, and some of the people were intermarrying among them. See Ezra 9, verses 1 and 2, and Nehemiah 13, verses 23 to 29. And the Bible records the same thing as to the various other Canaanite peoples. Further proof of this is found in various places such as Ezekiel 16, verses 1 to 3. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother was a Hittite. Now God could not have said this truthfully as to any real Israelite. But he was not saying it to Israelites. He said it to the city of Jerusalem and her people. These were in large part Canaanite Jews, and they had gained power in the manner by which Jews always gained it. Hence, Jerusalem was becoming more and more corrupt, as most of the prophets record. They surrounded and became the influential advisors of the kings of Judah. Just as today they surround and make up almost all of the influential advisors of our president. We find clear proof of this in Isaiah 3, verses 8 and 9, where he says, For Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord, to provoke the eyes of his glory. The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Now in China, where their rulers were Chinese, you couldn't say that the show of their countenance doth witness against them, for their faces would be just like those of the rest of the Chinese. And in Sweden, where their ruling class were Swedes, you couldn't say that their faces were a witness against them, for they'd be the same kind of Swedish faces as the rest of the people had. But in Jerusalem, the faces of the Canaanite Jebusite Jews identified them and were a witness against them. The real Israelites were not hook-nosed. The ancient kings of Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon were very vain about their military conquests, and they left carved stone monuments telling how they had captured this city and that one, killed so many people and enslaved the others, and so forth. And on these monuments, they usually also had carved in the stone pictures of the captive people. Whenever they showed Israelites, the faces had straight noses and were generally of the Anglo-Saxon type. But when they showed Canaanites, the faces were those of typical hook-nosed Jews. Therefore, the faces of the Canaanite Jebusite Jews who had gained controlling power as merchants, bankers, advisors of the king, the wealthy ruling class, identified them as separate from the real Israelites. The show of their countenance doth witness against them. And they had indeed ruined the kingdom of Judah. Now go back and read the many places where Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel condemn the wickedness which was found in Jerusalem. Don't you find the same conditions existing today in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and Washington, D.C., where large numbers of the same people have gained power through their wealth? So we find that there were still large numbers of Canaanites in the land, integrated with the real Israelites and Judahites, and bringing the lowering of standards which integration always brings. Look at the city of Washington, D.C., for example. Besides the Jebusites in Jerusalem, the Bible records that the other Canaanite peoples, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, and the Amorites, were not exterminated nor driven out, but merely conquered and made to pay a tribute tax and left in the land to be integrated with the people and corrupt them. So these Canaanites were another element of the Jews in the time of Jesus Christ. You will remember that when the people of Israel left Egypt, they were accompanied by a mixed or mongrel multitude. The same is true of the return of the remnant of the people of the kingdom of Judah from their captivity in Babylon. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah record the return. 
They showed that the total number who returned was 42,360. But they also show that among these were many who were not Israelites of any tribe. They were Babylonians who would come with them in order to get in on the ground floor, as the saying is. And they had even infiltrated into the priesthood. But it says that these thought their register among those who were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. When you add up the total of all these other elements listed in Ezra and Nehemiah, they equal 8,381 of these alien Babylonians, or about one-fifth of all the people who returned from Babylon to Palestine. So they also formed another element of the Jews of the land in Jesus Christ's time. Now one more, and we complete the list and that is the Edomites. You will remember that Esau and Jacob were twin brothers, but Esau was a man of such low character that we have God's own testimony in Malachi 1, verses 2 and 3. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. Jacob kept the race line pure, and God changed his name to Israel and made him the father of God's own chosen people, Israel. But Esau married two Canaanite wives and one Ishmaelite wife and left only half-breed mongrel children. See Genesis 26, verses 34 and 35, Genesis 27, verse 46, and Genesis 36, verse 3. As his mongrel descendants couldn't marry into the true Semitic line, he moved out from among them and went down to Mount Seir, the rugged range of mountains southeast of the Dead Sea. And this land was called Edom, or occasionally by the Grecianized form of the word, Idumea. Thereafter, his descendants were called Edomites. See Genesis 33, verse 16, and Genesis 36, verses 1 to 9. There they had a long and troublesome history. Esau's grandson was Amalek, father of the tribe of Amalek, who were such an evil lot that in Exodus 17, verses 14 to 18, God said that he would have perpetual war with Amalek until they were all destroyed. The Edomites constantly harassed the southern portions of Israel until King Saul beat them off about 1087 B.C. But Saul disobeyed God's command to exterminate them, and for this disobedience God deposed him as king in favor of David. See 1 Samuel 15, verses 1 to 26. But even David didn't exterminate them, and there was a long history of wars between Edom and Israel, later between Edom and Judah. You will find it set out in 2 Kings, chapters 8 and 14, and in 2 Chronicles, chapters 20 and 25. The whole book of Obadiah is devoted to God's condemnation of Edom's treacherous attack upon the kingdom of Judah when Judah was being conquered by Babylon. During the Babylonian captivity of Judah, the land lay nearly empty. And during this period, the people of Edom, partly from opportunity and partly from pressure against them from the east, moved over into the vacant southern half of the old kingdom of Judah. See Funk and Wagner's New Standard Bible Dictionary, pages 198 and 199, and Scribner's Dictionary of the Bible, Volume 2, pages 644 and 645. From this new area, they continued to harass the little nation which returned from Babylon. By about the year 142 B.C., the returned exiles of Judah won complete independence under the Maccabean line of kings. And about 120 B.C., John Hyrcanus, one of the Maccabee kings, conquered the Edomites. But he too, instead of exterminating them, took them into his kingdom, offering them full citizenship if they would give up their paganism and adopt the religion of Judaism. This they did, and from 120 B.C. they were full citizens of the kingdom. See Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 13, Chapter 9, and see also the Jewish Encyclopedia, Volume 5, Page 41. By the year 69 B.C., incompetent leadership and rising intrigue within the Maccabean monarchy, together with the rising power of Rome in Western Asia, gave opportunity to Antipater, also called Antipas, 
an Edomite chieftain and founder of the Herodian family, to rise to power. By bribery, boldness, and military skill, he gained the favor of Rome, and the Romans made him procurator or governor of Judea. His son, Herod I, beginning as governor of Galilee, used the same methods to secure appointment as king of Judea in 40 B.C., and by 37 B.C. he had gained complete control of Judea. He maintained himself in power by extreme ruthlessness and by bribery, for which he taxed the people very heavily. So the New Deal, Raw Deal, and New Horizons are not so new after all. This is the same Herod who had all the little male children in Bethlehem murdered, trying to murder Jesus Christ in his infancy. His son, Herod Archelaus, held the governorship, the Romans wouldn't trust him with the crown, for ten years of astonishingly evil misrule, from 4 B.C. to 6 A.D., after which the Romans convicted him of crimes and removed him. And thereafter, Judea was governed by Roman procurators, of whom Pontius Pilate was number six. Nevertheless, the Romans left practically complete power of local government in the hands of the Herodian Edomites, who had complete control of the temple and power to enforce all their local laws. Remember how Pontius Pilate tried to get out of condemning Jesus Christ, telling the Jews, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. That's John 18, verse 31. These Edomite Jews could say that Abraham was an ancestor of theirs through Esau, as they did in John 8, 33. But this Hebrew blood through Esau had been diluted to the vanishing point by 1,700 years of marrying only people of Canaanite racial stocks. Therefore, Jesus Christ rebuked them for falsely claiming to be still of Abrahamic and therefore inferentially of Israelite lineage. For he told them in John 8, verse 44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. You should very carefully reread the 8th chapter of John, verses 31 to 47. These were Jews to whom Jesus was speaking, and the Bible identifies them as Jews. In the Jewish Encyclopedia, the article on Edom in concludes with the words, The Edomites today are found in modern Jewry. Now let us review for a moment what we have covered. We have seen that Jesus Christ was not a Jew by religion, for the Jews based their religion on the Babylonian Talmud, which was at that time called the Tradition of the Elders. And Jesus Christ's whole ministry was one constant battle against the evils of Judaism. We have seen that Jesus Christ was a true Israelite of the tribe of Judah by race. And we have seen that the Jews of his time included the mongrel descendants of Shelah, the mongrel mixed multitude which followed the Israelites out of Egypt, the various Canaanite peoples in Palestine, including the Jebusites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, and the Amorites, and finally the mongrelized descendants of Esau, the Edomites. Now do you understand why Jesus Christ, who said that he was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, told the Jews, I know my sheep, and they know me. But ye, the Jews, ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That's in the tenth chapter of John. The tiny remnant of Judah and Benjamin which came back to Palestine from the Babylonian captivity did leave some descendants in Palestine. But these were Jesus Christ's sheep, and he himself said that he knew them, they knew him, and they followed him. All those in Palestine who became Christians were true members of the tribe of Judah or of the tribe of Benjamin, but they were not Jews. And the Jews were not members of Judah, Benjamin, or any other Israelite tribe, for Jesus Christ himself said they are not of his sheep. Now we know who it was who constituted the Jews in Jesus Christ's time. If you want to bring it down to date and find out who are the Jews in our own day, we must add one more racial element. Of course, the descendants of the Jews of Jesus Christ's day are among them, but there is also another element, the Khazars. These make up the Slavic and Germanic Jews of today. Meanwhile, we must return to the Jews of Palestine for a few words. 
As you know, by A.D. 68, the Romans had found the rascality of the Palestinian Jews so intolerable that they began the campaign which resulted in the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Nearly all the Jews were then expelled from Palestine, and most of them migrated in large numbers to what was then called Byzantium, later called Constantinople, and today is known as Istanbul, facing the Bosphorus, outlet of the Black Sea. Here again they demonstrated the truth of the Bible's lesson, that conduct is the product of character, or in Jesus Christ's own words, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. By about the year 300 A.D., their rascality had again become so intolerable that they were again expelled, and they moved northeast across the Black Sea into the Khazar kingdom. About the year 150 A.D., <clears throat> the Khazars, an Asiatic people related to the Turks, migrated westward from Central Asia and established a great empire which covered what is today southwestern Russia, north of the Aral Sea, the Caspian Sea, and the Black Sea, and including the Don and Dnieper Valleys and the Crimea. About the year 740 A.D., Bulan, the Kagan, or king of the Khazars, was converted to the religion of Judaism, together with some 4,000 of the most powerful nobility of the kingdom. In those days, it was not healthful for a subject to be in religious conflict with his king or with the baron on whose land he lived. So in due course, most of the Khazars became Jews by religion. In fact, it became part of the kingdom's constitution that no one but a Jew by religion could be king. The principal languages spoken were the Khazar language, which is called Yiddish today, and Turkish. During the great invasion by the Mongols under Genghis Khan, many of the Judaized Khazars were dispersed into what is now Poland and Lithuania. These Khazars, Jews by religion, constitute the Slavic Jews today, those with names such as Minsky and Baranov and Moskovitz, the latter often shortened to Mos as you will note. Also, since much of the western part of this area has been at one time or another ruled by Austrian or Germanic peoples who brought in their own language, these Khazars also took Germanic names, such as Gold or Goldberg, Rosenberg, Eisler, and so forth. And if you are wondering how they can be so much like the other Jews, historical documents written at the time the Khazar Empire was at its greatest height refer to their tradition that their ancestors originally came from the region of Mount Seir, which is Edom, the home of the Edomite Jews. If you wish to look up further details, you will find brief articles on the Khazars in various encyclopedias, such as the Britannica. The Jewish encyclopedia has six pages on it. In some it is spelled K-H-A-Z-A-R, in others C-H-A-Z-A-R, and even other variations. It is also discussed in A History of the Jews by Solomon Grazel and A History of the Jews by Professor H. Grant, both works being published by the Jewish Publication Society of America. The most thorough discussion of the whole problem is found in that magnificent bit of historical research, The Iron Curtain Over America, by Colonel John Beatty. Colonel Beatty is an historian and professor of history whose works are used as textbooks in more than 700 colleges and universities. Iron Curtain Over America is one of the most thoroughly documented and accurate works ever put in print. It is well worth the $4 it costs. If you can't find a copy in your local bookstore, you can buy one by mail from Post Office Box 27895, Los Angeles 27, California. It should be in the library of every patriotic American and every good Christian. <clears throat> Perhaps you are now wondering, why does my Bible sometimes speak well of the Jews? Such as Paul saying in Romans that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And in Acts, Paul saying that he was a Jew of Tarsus. If you will look up these few instances in a good concordance, such as Strong's, you will find that in each instance the translators have written the word Jew in English where it was not used in the original Greek from which they mistranslated it. 
In each instance, in the original Greek, the word used was eudaios, which does not mean Jew, but simply a Judean, a person whose home is in the land of Judea, or southern Palestine. In Greek, it does not have a religious or a racial connotation. It is a geographical term like Californian. A Californian could be white, black, brown, or yellow by race. And he could be Christian, Jew, Buddhist, or atheist. So also, a Judaeus was merely a person who lived in Judea, where, as we saw, there were some Israelites of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, but there were far more Canaanite Jews, and also a general mixture of Romans, Greeks, Syrians, Egyptians, and so forth. It is true that Christian salvation was first offered in the land of Judea, hence to those who were living there, the Judaeus. And later, as the apostles traveled from city to city, it was soon offered to the Greeks. But it was never offered to the Jews as a preferred class, for you will remember that Jesus Christ taught only in impossible-to-understand parables when there were Jews around, and explained them privately to his disciples, explaining that he spoke among the Jews only in parables, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Both Matthew 13, verses 10 to 15, and Mark 4, verses 10 to 12, record this. Jesus Christ was taking great pains to see that the Jews could not understand Christianity and be converted. He was preaching only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the members of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, which he said were his sheep, who knew his voice and followed him. The Jews he rejected as the children of their father, the devil. Now, to sum it all up, the Jews are not and never were any part of any tribe of Israel. They include various mixtures of Egyptian, Babylonian, and Canaanite peoples, the Edomites, and later also the Khazars. Jesus Christ was a pure-blooded Israelite of the tribe of Judah without any Jewish ancestry, and he was not a Jew by religion. Now think this over carefully. The group of nations, which we loosely group under the term Anglo-Saxon, including the people of the British Isles, the Scandinavian nations, nearly all of Germany, Holland, some few of the people of France and Belgium, with the closely related people found in Austria, some of the Swiss, some of the Hungarians and North Italians, and their descendants now living in the United States, Canada, Australia, and South Africa, these people are the living descendants of the Israel of the Bible, blood brothers of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Aren't you proud of your ancestry? It is unfortunate that most people have so many mistaken ideas about their religion, due largely to the many mistranslations of words in the commonly used King James Version of the Bible. One of these mistaken ideas is that most of the people of the United States and Western Europe in fact, nearly all the Christians in the world are Gentiles. You hear many of them, even clergymen who should know better say, I'm just a Gentile saved by grace. I think it's high time that we learn something about one of the most misused words, Gentile. First, you might be surprised to know that there is no such word in the Bible in its original languages. Oh, yes, I know, you're now riffling the pages of your King James Version, looking for some of the many places where you will find Gentile in the King James Version. But I said that there is no such word in the Bible in its original languages. The word was put into it by translators who changed the wording of the Bible centuries after the last book in the Bible was written. If you're a good Christian, you will surely agree with me that what the prophets originally wrote in the books which make up our Bible was inspired by God. It was correct as the prophets wrote it. But not one of them wrote in English, remember, because no such language as English existed until many centuries after the prophets lived. It was written in Hebrew as to the Old Testament, and the New Testament was originally written in the language which Jesus Christ spoke, Aramaic a Semitic dialect somewhat similar to, but not quite the same as, Hebrew. But Aramaic was not generally understood outside of Western Asia. So when Christianity began to spread into Southern and Southeastern Europe, 